Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Work Cover Queensland's Common Law webinar on vicarious liability and contributory negligence. My name is Hannah Staunton. I'm a lawyer at Work Cover Queensland and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to Queensland elders, past, present and emerging. We thank the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia for their ongoing custodianship of land, waters and community. Today's webinar will run for approximately one hour with some time for questions at the end. If you need to leave a bit earlier, this session will be recorded and we will send the link to the recording out via email by early next week. It will also be uploaded to WorkCover Queensland's YouTube channel. Please feel free to submit any questions during the webinar using the panel on the right hand side of the screen. We will aim to answer some of your questions after the main presentation if time permits. And just remember that any questions answered or advice provided today is general information only and should not be taken as legal advice. I'd like to introduce our guest speakers for today's webinar from Jensen McConaughey. First, I'd like to welcome back Ross, who previously presented for us about incident reporting back in August 2009. 2019, I should say. Ross is a partner and has extensive experience practicing exclusively in insurance and personal injury law, defending compulsory third party, workers' compensation, professional indemnity, and public liability claims. Ross will be presenting the contributory negligence section of today's webinar. And our second presenter for today is Leah Mogg, Special Counsel. Leah has extensive experience managing workers' compensation claims for WorkCover Queensland. A warm welcome to both you, Ross and Leah. Thank you for presenting for us today. And Leah, I'll now hand over to you. Thanks, Hannah. Today we will be focusing on vicarious liability in employment relationships. Which wrongful or tortious acts would fall to be indemnified under the workers' compensation policy? Vicarious liability in the employment setting is when the employee is held responsible for damages or harm caused by its workers to another worker. Today we'll be covering what is vicarious liability, what is or are unauthorised and illegal acts, and some case examples of horseplay, psychiatric injury and physical assault cases. Sort of. The origins of vicarious liability are derived from medieval notions of headship of a household, including wives and servants, their status in law being absorbed into that of the master. You'd be pleased to know that the High Court in 2001 acknowledged the changing nature of employment relationships since that time, including the development of the common law of negligence and the application of policy considerations. The rationale behind vicarious liability is essentially based on policy considerations, including the provision of a just and practical remedy for harm and the deterrence of future harm. This includes the expectation that an employer will have insured against the liability, the activity was undertaken on behalf of the employer and likely part of the business, and the employee was employed to carry out the activity which created the risk and would have been under the control of the employer. An employer owes a non-delegable duty of care, which is personal and cannot be delegated. Discharge of that duty requires an employer to provide a safe system of work, which in turn incorporates a requirement to provide competent staff and to supervise the staff. The court's view is that there is no point in distinguishing between an employer's primary liability or vicarious liability, where an employer has not reasonably established and maintained a system of work, either by its own actions or its workers' actions to whom the responsibility has been delegated. Examples of this is where a qualified welder sustained a back injury when attempt attempting to lift a heavy weight, which had been left in an inappropriate position by a co-worker. That work, the plaintiff had not been trained and was left to his own devices and the courts considered that it was not necessary to consider the vicarious liability, liability of the co-worker. Similar cases have been decided involving assaults between employees 
where there is no proper system of work to address the escalating misbehaviour in the workplace. An employer is not vicariously liable for the negligent actions of independent contractors. It is clear an employer who has authorised the worker's conduct will be held to be vicariously liable for the tortious acts of that worker. However, the courts have grappled with determining whether an employer can be vicariously liable for an unauthorised and illegal act of its worker. Much of the case law on vicarious liability, particularly decisions of the High Court, have focused on vicarious liability of an employer and harm occasioned by its workers to third parties, for example, school authorities and abuse against students by teachers, security officers and assaults against pub patrons, hospital and doctor's negligence in patient relationships. However, the tests arising out of these cases have been implied in, in the employment setting. The High Court has considered the question of vicarious liability in numerous decisions, including New South Wales and Lepore, which included judgments relating to some Queensland cases. These claims related to whether school authorities were vicariously liable for assaults, referred to as intentional torts committed by teachers. In that case, the High Court bench consisted of seven judges and there were four judgments delivering different tests for determining vicarious liability. The cases give an overview of the history of the development of and scope of vicarious liability. In that case, the Chief Justice, Ms. Chief Justice Gleeson stated that an employer was vicariously liable for a tort committed within the scope of employment, that everything that an employee did at work was not conclusive against liability, nor was everything that a worker did away from the workplace conclusive against liability. The antithesis of the conduct in the course of employment was sometimes expressed by saying that the employee was on a frolic of his own. The term arose in the 19th century when coachmen tended to drive off with their master's vehicles upon a frolic of their own and sometimes injure a passerby. The masters were said to have engaged competent workers and to determine whether liability ought to be sheeted home to the masters gave rise to the test expressed as, was the servant's act within the scope of, or course of his employment? Chief Justice Gleeson noted the historical formulation of the test arose from a from, arose in 1907 from a publication of Salmond, The Law of Torts. Mr. Salmond was actually a professor, um, was a barrister, became a professor and was knighted, knighted in 1918 and appointed as a Supreme Court judge in New Zealand in 1920. Um, that case essentially, or that text essentially was that what had to be determined is whether the employee causing the harm was acting within the scope of employment, was performing an authorised act which was connected with the employment or whether they were on a frolic of their own and that the act could said, be said to be an independent act. The decision of the Chief Justice Gleeson was adopted in the Queensland Court of Appeals approach in Howl at the Moon, Broad Beach. That court decided that vicarious liability may exist if the wrongful act was done in the intended pursuit of the employer's interests or in intended performance of the contract of employment and also in circumstances where there was ostensible authority to act. It was necessary to identify what the employee was actually employed to do or held out by the employer as being employed to do. Thirteen years later, Next slide. The matter was again considered by the High Court, but this time the High Court consisted of an entirely new bench. Prince Alfred College Incorporated involved a plaintiff having been sexually abused by a housemaster. Again, the case was in the context of harm caused to a third party and was an application for extension of the limitation period. The court acknowledged the differing views of the judgments expressed in the court, the previous decision, which was decided against the background of developments in Canada and the UK, and noted there had been yet further developments in each of those jurisdictions. 
The High Court in Prince Alfred College adopted a new test which was entitled the relevant approach, which was to consider any special role the employer has assigned to the employee and the position in which the employee was placed vis-a-vis -vis the victim. These considerations included authority, power, trust, control, and, and in those cases, ability to achieve intimacy with the victim. There has been further developments in the UK Supreme Court and noting that the Australian High Court has looked to this jurisdiction in revising its approach to vicarious liability. Just briefly, there was a decision of the Supreme Court in the UK which held that the lower courts, which included the initial court, which decision was confirmed by the Court of Appeal before reaching the High Court, the, the Supreme Court, that a senior auditor tasked with collating personal information of thousands of employees online and releasing that information to the public after being subjected to disciplinary proceedings was in fact pursuing a personal vendetta against the employer and could not be said to be acting in furtherance of the employer's business. And the imposition of vicarious liability, which was found by the lower courts, was precluded. There was also a recent decision of Barclays Bank, wherein the Supreme Court reinforced the development of the application of vicarious liability, which the lower courts had eroded in terms of the distinction between employment and independent contractor. The lower courts had found the Barclays Bank was vicariously liable for, an in, for a doctor that had been engaged to perform medical examinations and took the opportunity to assault workers during the course of those medical examinations. The court emphasised that there had been no erosion of the distinction between employee and independent contractor. So in looking at some examples arising out of the Australian courts, um, as to whether an employee will be considered vicariously liable for the wrongful act of a plaintiff's co-worker will depend on the particular circumstances. It is necessary to identify what the worker causing the harm was actually employed to do, look at what their duties and responsibilities were, was there some connection or nexus between the employer's business and the wrongful act, was it an authorised or an unauthorised mode of performing the duties and responsibilities, or was the worker in fact on a frolic of their own? The case law is very factually dependent and it is not possible to say that the findings in one case will apply to the next. An example in horseplay is a Victorian Court of Appeal decision in Blake and J.R. Perry nominees. That case involved three fuel tanker drivers waiting at the dock to refuel a much delayed supply vessel. The drivers were required to overnight remain close to the respective vehicles due to the dangerous goods that were carried and essentially fill in an 18 hour period. During this time, there was some clowning around, playing pranks, some cricket and football, but boredom was being experienced by all the drivers. Approximately 18 hours later, the plaintiff was injured by a co-worker when, without warning, he was struck hard to the back of the knees, fell and sustained injury to his back. There was no animosity or intent to cause harm and the trial judge considered the employer was not vicariously liable and this decision was confirmed on appeal. Of interest in that case was the dissenting judge approached, uh, uh, the dissenting judge which found that there was vicarious liability applied the sufficient connection test saying that it was just that the employer should be liable for the plaintiff's injury. The majority decision applied all the tests that came out of the decision in Lepore, including the more recent um, decision, and, and consider that any application of those tests resulted in the employer not being vicariously liable. The acting, or the, sorry, the appeal judge Harper considered that consideration ought to be given to the approach that vicarious liability should only be imposed for intentional torts where the employee was entrusted with a protective or fiduciary discretion, but considered that this was a question for another day, but if he had applied that test, the plaintiff's claim would also fail.
A hypothetical scenario is a plaintiff truck driver sustains a back injury after falling backwards off a pallet jack. He had been riding like a scooter at the employer's depot, which operated a road freight transfer, transport business. CCTV showed the plaintiff riding the pallet jack like a scooter through the depot back to his truck, using one leg to push it several times. A co-worker ran up behind the plaintiff and used his foot to kick one of the tines of the pallet jack resulting in the plaintiff falling backwards. The defence case was that the plaintiff and the co-worker were engaged in horseplay and as such, the co-worker's actions were alleged to have been outside the scope of his employment and the defendant was not vicariously liable for the spontaneous act of the co-worker kicking the pallet jack. The plaintiff had also alleged the employer breached its duty of care by prohibiting pranks and horseplay at the depot, suggesting that also, he believed that there were some actions of horseplay underway. The plaintiff had received training in pallet jack and also code of co the code of conduct which did not permit horseplay. We'll come back to the results of that decision later. But in um, the earlier case of knee, sorry, Blake and Perry nominees, the judge considered that it was really a, that the prank was generated wholly within the confines of the co-worker's brain and was not within the course of his employment and also considered that the employer was not vicariously liable for such an action. In psychiatric injury claims, Improper modes of authorised acts can be found in psychiatric injury claims, particularly those where allegations of bullying and harassment are evident and directed at acts or omissions of co-workers in the course of their employment. An example of this is Nationwide News, which involved a plaintiff, a security officer, being employed by another security organisation and placed at the premises under the control of Nationwide News. The plaintiff was frequently subjected to racial vilification, bullying and harassment, which included personal and physical abuse and threats of transfer and ensuring the plaintiff would never work in the security industry again. This seemed to have followed the plaintiff's refusal to conduct building services privately for the abuser. Nationwide News had in place a written policy dealing with harassment. The abuse on one occasion was drawn to the attention of a senior executive after the plaintiff was observed to have been in tears, horrified and looking very scared. Apparently the abuser, as in most psychiatric injury case, cases, was noted to be adept at concealing the inappropriate conduct and the court considered that his conduct constituted an intentional tort, was deliberate and intended to demean, offend and injure. The court found that the host employer, Nationwide News, was vicariously liable if any of the different formulations in Lepore was applied. However, it found that the ISS, the actual employer, was not liable as it had no element of control over the abuser and the abuser's conduct was not closely connected with anything that he, it, that he was doing for on behalf of IWS. Another decision, which is a decision of the Queensland District Court in Robinson and Lorna Jane, considered by a vicarious liability in the context of a psychiatric injury claim, with the trial judge stating that it was not a form of absolute liability and each case would turn on its own facts. The trial judge referred to the decision of Prince Alfred College and stated the first step was to identify what was the alleged wrongful act and the second was to determine if in all the relevant circumstances the employer was vicariously liable for that act. The trial judge considered the alleged wrongful acts and omissions which included name calling and also Facebook posts. The employer had strict policies against bullying by social media of which the co-worker supervisor was aware and for which the employer took disciplinary action. The trial judge applied a previous decision of the High Court, Deaton's, which was a 1949 decision and stated that the supervisor's acts of posting the Facebook entries were not done in the course of or connected with her employment or in furtherance of the employer's interests or under its express or implied authority and was not in, in an incident or in consequence of anything she was employed to do nor were they committed under the cover of the authority that the 
abuser was held out as possessing or were incidental to her position for which she represented the employer. The court also applied the High Court decision in Prince Alfred College and also stated that the Facebook posts were not done in the apparent performance of the role as supervisor or because of any special role that the employer had assigned to the supervisor to place her in a position or give her the occasion to take advantage of that by posting the offending Facebook entries. A recent development again arising out of the UK jurisdiction was a, an assault by a managing director of a company against its employee at an unplanned drinking session which followed an organised work Christmas party. The managing director was supervising at the Christmas party and then with a group of employees moved to a hotel where they were staying overnight. The majority of the drinks were paid for, paid for by the employer and the managing director remained with four other employees and their partners. They continued to drink alcohol and at around 2 a.m. they were discussing the employer's plans for the following year. The plaintiff mentioned that a co-worker who was a new employee was paid substantially more than anyone else and the managing director became annoyed and required the workers who were present to return to the hotel lobby, summoning them and then began to lecture them that he was he owned the company, was in charge and he would do what he wanted to do and that the decision was his to make. By this time they were all significantly inebriated and the managing director was in the process of losing his temper. The plaintiff in a non-aggressive manner challenged the placement of the new employee, stating it would be better if he was placed at another location. In response, the managing director punched the plaintiff who fell down. He got up and gestured to that, let, let's just list, let this go. However, the managing director lost all control and despite two workers trying to hold him back, broke free and again struck the plaintiff with a sickening blow such that he fell backwards, hitting his head on the lobby floor, sustaining a fractured skull and a traumatic brain injury. The trial judge found that the employer was not vicariously liable. However, on appeal, it was found that the, because of the actions of the managing director in summoning the workers and lecturing them about the business, it was held to, that there was a sufficient connection with the, his duties and the employer's business. One of the judges did caution that the um, combination of circumstances would arise rarely and that discussions about work in this particular case became an exercise in laying down the law and would not necessarily give rise to liability merely because there was an argument about work matters between colleagues which may lead to an assault even when one colleague was markedly more senior than another. It was not authority for the proposition that employees became insurers for violent or other tortious acts by their employees. In other um, cases involving physical assaults in the workplace in Australian jurisdictions, the courts have not tended to progress to determining vicarious liability as there have been findings of primary liability. Going back to the um, hypothetical, that decision was a decision of Justice Bodice in Sinkovic and Blenner's transport delivered in 2017. Whilst Justice Bodice did not find primary liability against the employer, he did find vicarious liability in that whilst kicking the tyne of the pallet jack could not be said to have been an act which was authorised by the defendant employer, the act occurred on the floor of the depot between co-workers in the context of the pallet jack being transported from one section of the depot to the other and the, co and the actions of the co-worker in pushing the pallet jack could be seen as an action to assist in the transportation of the pallet jack to its desired location and as such was an authorised act which occurred within the scope and course of employment and for which the defendant was vicariously liable. As an aside to that decision, 
the actual application for compensation had been rejected by both WorkCover and upheld by the regulator, but the plaintiff was successful before the Industrial Relations Commission. Easy. Um, thanks, Leah. We'll hand over to Ross now uh, to discuss the topic of contributory negligence. Thank you, Hannah, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, today I'll be discussing um, what contributory negligence is, initially in the context uh, of the case law um, that has developed in Australia in that respect, uh, how that's been modified to some extent and enshrined in legislation and then finish with some case examples and perhaps some emerging trends. So essentially at its most basic, uh, contributory negligence is the extent to which an injured worker's own negligence has caused or contributed to their injury. Uh, this has been summarised fairly well in a couple of decisions, but uh, the leading case in Bankstown, Foundry and Grace Steena uh, the High Court um, held that the worker's conduct must be judged on the basis of whether uh, he or she ought reasonably have foreseen that they would expose themselves to a risk of injury if they didn't act reasonably and prudently. Uh, there must first be, obviously, a finding of primary negligence against the employer before there can be a finding of contributory negligence against the worker. There's no finding of primary negligence against the employer, the case just fails. Uh, so there must first be a finding against the employer before that issue has to be decided. Uh, but most importantly, um, mere inadvertence, inattention or misjudgment on the part of the worker won't be enough to, um, for there to be a finding of contributory negligence. So to summarise that, the worker's conduct must cause or contribute to their injury in some way. And that conduct must be more than mere inadvertence, inattention or misjudgment. And at common law, the burden of proof for establishing contributory negligence always rests with the employer. By way of illustration, i uh, put up a brief um, hypothetical scenario. So say in this instance, uh, a worker fails to wear his steel cap boots, which he's been issued uh, by his employer in breach of the employer's PPE policy. Uh, during his shift, he walks across a section of factory floor. It's been made slippery due to the presence of a contaminant. He slips and falls, landing heavily on his outstre outstretched uh, wrist. Uh, he says that he didn't see the contaminant on, on the floor as his attention was focused on a forklift operating nearby. Now, in this scenario, did his conduct cause or contribute, contribute to his right wrist injury? Well, I guess there are a couple of issues uh, in this scenario. The first is his failure to wear his assigned um, steel cap boots in breach of the employer's policy. Now that might amount to a breach on his part uh, of the duty he owes and also of his um, terms of his employment. Uh, but did it contribute uh, or cause his right wrist injury? Well, the answer is, is pretty clearly no. It probably made little difference uh, what he was wearing at the time. The situation might have been different, for example, uh, if he wasn't wearing his steel cap boots and his foot was run over by the forklift and he sustained an injury to his forefoot. Uh, in that case, obviously, his failure to wear the steel cap boots has very clearly contributed to his injury. Uh, was his uh, conduct mere inadvertence, inattention or misjudgment? Uh, well, I think he would be forgiven in the circumstances in that uh, scenario for paying attention to the movements of the forklift. Um, he might be criticised for not, walk, not looking where he was walking, but weighing up the respective risks involved, I think a court is unlikely to be heavily critical of him for um, not paying attention to the forklift and, and uh, in that moment not looking at the floor. So it might be um, in that scenario uh, that it would be, uh, it would amount to mere inadvertence, inattention or misjudgment. So an allegation of contributory negligence against the worker in that scenario would likely fail, in my view. So how does the court approach a finding of contributory negligence and how does that factor into the final assessment of damages? Um, the leading pronouncement on the apportionment of responsibility between the worker on one hand and the employer on the other is found in the High Court case of 
Podrobersic and Australian Iron and Steel. In that case, the High Court said that the exercise involves a comparison of both culpability, which is the degree of departure from the standard of care of the reasonable man or person, uh, of both the employer and the worker, and also the relative, relative importance of the acts of each of the parties in causing the injury. So it's the whole conduct of each negligent party in relation to the circumstances of the accident which must be subjected to a subjected to a comparative examination. So effectively, it's a weighing up exercise, looking at the relative degrees of each party's culpability, uh, which is then reduced to a percentage apportionment. Now, to some extent, uh, the law in relation to contributory negligence has been enshrined in the Workers' Compensation and Rehabilitation Act and slightly modified uh, in one relatively important respect, but one that doesn't arise terribly often. I'll briefly comment on uh, those provisions. So Section 305 capital H of the Act says that a court may make a finding of contributory neg negligence in seven scenarios. Uh, the first is failing to comply with reasonable workplace health and safety instructions given by the employer. Uh, secondly, failing to use protective clothing and equipment. Failing to use anything designed to reduce the worker's exposure to the risk of injury. Inappropriately interfering with or misusing something that was designed to reduce the risk of injury. Being adversely affected by the intentional consumption of alcohol or a drug undertaking an activity that involves an obvious risk, and I'll come back to that, and failing without reasonable excuse to attend safety training, which pro would probably have avoided or minimised the risk of injury. Section 305H2 uh, um, makes it clear that um, those seven scenarios uh, don't limit the court and it can make other findings at its discretion, uh, which might amount to contributory negligence. Um, I mentioned before uh, that a court can reduce a worker's damages uh, for contributory negligence if the worker undertakes an activity that involves uh, an obvious risk of injury. Section 305I says that an obvious risk uh, yeah, that is one that would have been obvious to a reasonable person in the position of the worker, so it's an objective test. It includes risks that are patent or a matter of common knowledge. An example of that might be, for example, a worker putting their hand into live machinery without first isolating it. That might amount uh, to an obvious risk. There are other scenarios that you can probably think of. Section 305F uh, sets out the standard of care for contributory negligence. Um, that is, it's that of a reasonable person in the position of the worker and is to be decided on the basis of what the person knew or ought reasonably to have known at the time of the injury. So the worker's training and experience will be taken into account uh, when assessing contributory negligence. Section 305J um, creates a presumption uh, of contributory negligence if the injured worker was intoxicated at the time of the injury. Uh, unlike the common law situation or the, the situation under the court made law, the burden of proof is reversed uh, in this scenario and it's up to the injured worker to rebut the presumption of contributory negligence uh, by establishing on the balance of probabilities either that the intoxication didn't contribute to the breach of duty or the intoxication was not self-induced. If, however, the presumption can't be rebutted, then the worker's damages must be reduced by at least 25% and even higher in some cases if that involves, uh, if, if the negligence involves the driving of a motor vehicle, uh, it can be as high as 50, or a minimum of 50%. Uh, section 305G uh, says that the court can, if it considers it just and equitable to do so, uh, reduce a worker's damages by 100% for contributory negligence, with the result that the claim is defeated. Um, this has been pleaded in a number of cases, 
but to date there have been no uh, cases in Queensland, certainly not that I'm aware of, uh, where such a defence has been successful. Uh, it has, that argument has been run in the compulsory third party scheme, there's similar, similar provisions in the Motor Accident Insurance Act. Uh, there's one case that touches on that issue, but to date in the um, workers' compensation scheme, there have been no cases where a worker's uh, damages have been reduced by 100% on account of their own contributory negligence. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on to some case examples. The first four cases uh, I want to talk about are cases where there have been findings of contributory negligence. Uh, and then I'll discuss a few other cases where contributory negligence has been pleaded by the employer, but um, no reduction of the workers' damages were made. The first uh, case is a matter of Samways, where the plaintiff was employed as a concreter. He sustained an injury to his left shoulder when he walked into the raised bucket of a bobcat on a construction site. The bobcat was parked close to where he and other workers were um, preparing to pour a slab. Uh, he'd been instructed by his supervisor to locate and retrieve some conduit. Uh, he said that he didn't notice the raised bucket of the bobcat because his attention was focused on the ground, being in a construction site. The judge in that case, Justice Applegarth in the Brisbane Supreme Court, found that the plaintiff had failed to pay sufficient attention to the bobcat and failed to have regard to his own safety when moving around the site. Uh, the exercise of reasonable care for his own safety required him to glance up from the ground regularly to avoid potential hazards. Uh, his failure to do so could not be described as mere inadvertence, inattention or mismanagement. Uh, and in that case, the plaintiff's damages were reduced by 20% for contributory negligence. In the matter of Osborne, this is a decision of Justice McMeekin in the Rockhampton Supreme Court. Uh, the plaintiff was a driller in the mines, uh, very experienced, some 20 years. He was instructed to drill cable bolt holes at a marked location in a tunnel, uh, and that was an everyday task for him, something he'd done multiple times. He was injured when he fell down a hole or stope in the mine floor at the end of the tunnel. In this case, there were a number of barriers to him reaching that stope or hole in the floor, including two barriers consisting of chains slung across the tunnel, on which were hung signs saying danger, no unauthorised entry, and danger, open stope below, near the entry to the tunnel and near the stope. Justice McMeekin in that case found that the risk of falling over the edge of the stope was plainly foreseeable and in fact was the reason why those barriers were erected. However, he found that the defendant employer could have avoided or significantly reduced the risk of injury by providing the plaintiff with precise written instructions about the exact location of the markings and by placing a bund immediately before the stope. So there was a finding of primary liability against the employer. However, the plaintiff's failure to scan the area carefully before proceeding was also found to be a significant departure from the standard of care expected of a minor with his experience and was a significant contributing factor to the occurrence of the accident. So the damages in that case he was awarded were reduced by 35% for his contributory negligence. Uh, Klein uh, is another mining case, again decided by Justice McMeekin in Rockhampton. The, fact in that, the facts in that case involved uh, the plaintiff working an overtime shift in an underground coal mine uh, with workers who weren't normally part of his crew. Uh, it was accepted that he sustained an injury to his lumbar spine when moving a very heavy object weighing approximately 180 kilograms. And the defendant employer conceded that it was liable uh, for any injury suffered by him if the finding was that uh, he was moving a weight in excess of 100 kilograms. Uh, Justice McMeekin uh, in that case found that there was no evidence that the plaintiff knew the weight of the object prior to the injury or that he any, had any prior familiarity with the object or what it, what it might weigh. His evidence, which was accepted, was that it was the first time he'd been involved in the install phase of a long wall. He was the most junior employee present 
and was following the directions of more senior miners and effectively copying their actions. That wasn't challenged. However, it was the responsibility the judge found of each worker to undertake a SLAM, a stop, look, assess and manage risk assessment, not just the responsibility of the supervisor. And that was not done by the plaintiff in this case or any of his fellow workers prior to the incident. And in, that, in doing so, the plaintiff breached the instructions that have been provided um, by his employer for his, safe, uh, his health and safety. The judge found that the plaintiff failed to act as a reasonable and prudent man in following the lead of more senior miners, noting that the plaintiff knew the object to be extremely heavy, although he wasn't familiar with it, it was apparent that it would be. Um, one person in the group did know the weight of the object and even a cursory assessment by the crew should have resulted in that knowledge being revealed and shared. The plaintiff had been employed in the mining industry for many years, was well aware of the need to be on the lookout for situations involving uh, the potential for injury and had been trained to assess the risk of injury involved in each task with a reassessment by a supervisor if the risk uh, could not be reduced to an acceptable level. If those measures had been undertaken and that reassessment done, that would have resulted in some alternative work method being adopted. And in that case, Justice McMeekin reduced the plaintiff's damages by 25%. Uh, Kennedy, again, another decision of Justice McMeekin. Uh, the plaintiff in that case was replacing a section of pipework, which was carrying a uh, caustic substance. He failed to isolate the pipe and to prove isolation, as he'd been trained to do uh, prior to commencing the work, uh, with the result that the caustic material came into contact with his left foot, uh, suffering burn injuries. The defendant admitted liability in that case, but argued contributory negligence on the part of the plaintiff. Justice McMeekin found that the plaintiff was well aware of the risks and dangers associated with that task. He'd been trained uh, to isolate the pipe and to prove isolation before undertaking the work. He had failed to follow the training and instructions he'd received and had no reasonable excuse for doing that. His actions went well beyond mere inadvertence, inattention or misjudgment. And his departure from the standards expected of a reasonable worker was substantial, uh, the judge found, and causative of um, his injury, which was very significant. Uh, the plaintiff's damages in that case were reduced by 50% for his contributory negligence, which I should add is a very high assessment of contributory negligence. Uh, that finding of Justice McMeekin was upheld on appeal. So now turn to some cases, and I've got to say there's far more of these uh, than, uh, than to the contrary, uh, where uh, contributory negligence has been alleged by uh, an employer, uh, but not uh, been successful. Uh, the first is a matter of uh, Richard Garth, BSE Cairns Slipways, a decision of Justice Moorzone in the Cairns District Court. Uh, in that case, the plaintiff was working as a night shift foreman at a slipway business, and his duties involved locking up and turning off all the lights at the slipway at the end of his shift each night. Uh, he'd undertaken that shutting down process several days a week for around six months. Uh, the, his process and path varied each night depending on the jobs he was undertaking, the number of staff and whether areas were used each night. Uh, he suffered an injury to his left wrist when he tripped on a metal box in a walkway outside the smoko room during the night shift, lost his balance and fell. Uh, the box that he tripped on had a dark grey metallic surface and was fixed to a concrete pad surrounded by a dark grey blackened ground surface in the foreground uh, and the concrete surface in the background. So it was very hard uh, for him to detect it in the minimal light available. It was around 70 centimetres long, 52 centimetres wide and 300 centimetres high. And as I say, there's little or no lighting in the area, but he was carrying a torch. The judge in that case found that the uh, plaintiff's conduct was consistent with inattention, bred of familiarity of the area and repetition of the task. And he found that that conduct amounted to mere inadvertence, inattention or misjudgment and did not amount to contributory negligence. So no finding was made uh, 
in that case. Uh, Meraki and Interport Cargo Services, a decision of Justice Shanahan in the Brisbane District Court. Uh, in that case, the plaintiff was employed as a labourer uh, and his tasks involved unpacking goods from shipping containers. And on this occasion, he was unpacking vehicles. Before the vehicles could be moved, he had to dismantle a number of timber chocks and dunnage, securing those vehicles in place within the containers and he used a crowbar supplied by the employer to separate the chocks uh, from a wooden platform. He sustained lumbar spine injury when attempting to pull on a chock that he thought was loose but was in fact partially nailed down to the platform. The judge in that case found that the employer had breached its duty of care by failing to instruct him not to separate the pieces of wood that were partially nailed down by hand. Uh, while the risk of injury was obvious, uh, he found that the employer should have guarded against that risk by ensuring its training highlighted the dangers of performing the task in that way. Uh, it was found that a practice had routinely uh, developed and been adopted by the plaintiff and other employees to use their hands when wooden pieces were partially dismantled. And there was no finding of contributory negligence because the plaintiff was simply following a system of work uh, which was permitted to continue by the employer. Uh, I've mentioned there the silver lining uh, in that decision was that the plaintiff was only awarded about $5,000 clear of the uh, refund to work cover Queensland. Coots and concrete panels is a very curious um, judgment. Um, for those of you not aware of the facts, they're, they're relatively convoluted, even though the, the, the scenario of the injury is quite simple and the case involved multiple parties. But essentially the plaintiff was employed at the time of his injury as a foreman or supervisor for a company which performed concrete works. They were in the process of building a motor vehicle showroom. And uh, at the time of his injury, uh, they were um, uh, digging footings for, um, uh, to pour concrete, uh, concrete slabs and, and footings around the, uh, around the showroom floor. Um, he was working on a trench uh, with, uh, which had been dug by an excavator to a depth of about 700 millimetres, uh, although on one side there was a 2.6 metre high excavation face. Uh, the plaintiff in his capacity as the on-site foreman and supervisor stopped work on the trench when he noticed gravel and compacted fill starting to fall from the exca excavated face into the trench and he uh, decided that the face would need to be braced uh, by another party before work could resume. At that time, he was acting as a, um, effectively as a spotter for one of the other defendant's labourers while that work was being carried out. And while he was acting in his capacity as a spotter, and again, remembering he was also the, uh, the foreman and supervisor, he considered that the risk of the um, uh, excavated uh, side of the, or face of the trench collapsing was a serious risk uh, and um, he instructed the labourer to get out of the trench and to retrieve some plant equipment. Um, when the labourer exited the trench, uh, the plaintiff noticed that he'd left his drill in the trench and he um, formed the view that it was in danger of being buried uh, by Phil falling into the trench. So he hopped into the trench to retrieve the labourer's drill uh, the inevitable happened while he was in the trench, uh, the excavated uh, face collapsed, partially burying him up to his chest, uh, as a result of which he sustained a lumbar spine injury and developed post-traumatic stress disorder. The defendants in that case um, alleged contributory negligence um, and argued, uh, one of the arguments was that the risk was obvious uh, he, the plaintiff himself, having formed the view uh, that the trench was at risk of collapse, uh, it was um, uh, an obvious risk for him to climb into the trench to retrieve a piece of equipment, and he exposed himself to um, to injury, a risk of injury. Um, the judge in that case, Justice Crow, uh, who replaced Justice McMeekin in the Rockhampton Supreme Court, 
uh, found that a finding of contributory negligence under section 305H1F of the Act was open on the facts as the plaintiff considered the risk was obvious. The plaintiff knew the trench was at risk of collapse and had expressed a clear desire not to enter the trench until after the bracing work had been undertaken. However, the plaintiff had observed other workers in the area previously in the trench without injury occurring to them. And he found the plaintiff was then logically able to form the conclusion that there was an, ex an extremely little prospect of him being injured if he entered the trench, as he did because in order to retrieve the drill, he would need to expose himself to the danger for a very short period of time. Uh, the plaintiff had to assess the risk of collapse occurring in the several seconds he needed to retrieve the drill and balance that risk against leaving the drill to be buried or damaged, further delaying the works. So effectively, a calculated uh, risk uh, was taken by the plaintiff, according to the judge. Uh, Justice Crow found that the plaintiff's actions could not be said to be inadvertent. Uh, he took a calculated risk which involved misjudgment because in hindsight, in fact, the face collapsed. But uh, the courts are not permitted to um, view factual circumstances with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, and the judge in that case found that without the benefit of hindsight, it simply amounted to a serious momentary misjudgment by the plaintiff and did not call for an apportionment of contributory negligence. So in that case, the plaintiff's damages um, were not reduced. Uh, again, I say it's a, it's a curious decision. Um, the test of serious momentary misjudgment is something we've not seen before. Um, that uh, an appeal was lodged, but later withdrawn uh, in that case. But uh, as I say, an unusual result, and uh, one which a lot of people didn't expect. Uh, Welsh and boutique venues involved a chef working in a, a, a restaurant kitchen, uh, retrieving a tray of cream brulees and hot water from an elevated oven uh, when the hot water spilt over the side of the tray, burning her forearms. Uh, there were, the evidence was that there were three other available ovens in the kitchen which were um, lower than the uh, elevated oven, which uh, the uh, plaintiff could have used, including an oven below bench height. Uh, the plaintiff had placed the oven, uh, placed the tray into the oven herself about an hour prior to her injury. Uh, the judge in that case is uh, Judge Rosengrim uh, in the Brisbane District Court, uh, accepted that retrieving a tray containing hot water from an elevated height in circumstances where the contents of the tray uh, couldn't be seen involved an obvious risk of injury. However, it was not so clear that it would have been obvious to a reasonable, a reasonable person in the position of the plaintiff because firstly, she had not received any training which prohibited the use of the uh, elevated oven for cream brulee trays. Uh, the employer had not maintained or enforced a system whereby cream brulees were cooked in the underbench pastry oven with the consequence that chefs were using a variety of ovens to cook cream brulees, including the, um, the elevated oven. Uh, the plaintiff's evidence was that it was uh, her experience um, that the elevated oven was the best of the four ovens in the kitchen to cook cream brulees. And for some years prior to the uh, incident, the plaintiff had been re regularly using that oven to cook cream brulees and had done so without incident. And the uh, oven had also been used to cook other food items containing hot water and other hot liquids. Um, so the judge in that case found that the, um, the fundamental problems involved a lack of training and an inadequacy of the defendant's system uh, and that the plaintiff should not be held responsible in part for the injuries that she suffered. So the result in that case was that no contributory negligence was found. Ross, I'm just going to ask you a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned earlier um, that a lot of the contributory negligence arguments aren't successful. Just wondering if you have any practical advice um, for employers that maybe perhaps would lead to us having stronger arguments in that area. Sure. I mean, it, a lot of it comes down to, as you see from these cases, um, matters surrounding adequacy of training. Um, the, um, the test under the Act involves 
uh, when you look at the standard of care that the injured worker owes to themselves, uh, you have to look at that against the background of their, their own circumstances. So the better trained, uh, enforced and policed the worker is in relation to the safe systems of work, um, the better prospect a, an allegation of contributory negligence uh, will be successful. And you'll see in those cases where there was a finding, uh, the, um, the judges have pointed out uh, in each of those cases, in fact, that the employer had provided sufficient training uh, to, the, um, uh, to the workers and that their training uh, had been disregarded effectively. So again, it, it does come back to um, developing systems, identifying uh, the hazards, developing the systems, uh, implementing safe work procedures, uh, enforcing those pr uh, procedures and policing and retraining. And I'm sure being the panel lawyer for work cover and the insured employee probably also uh, would like some of that documented if it comes your yes. way from a law claim. We, um, we lawyers love pieces of paper. Uh, we love pieces of paper that have got signatures on them, and if, if that involves uh, um, acknowledgement of training that's relevant and detailed enough uh, and would have made a difference in the circumstances, uh, that's extremely helpful to us. Especially when obviously some time can elapse between a statutory claim when it's lodged and Correct. sometimes those stat claims don't appear in common law land for two plus years afterwards. So. Correct, yeah, and that goes back to I guess the last uh, webinar I was involved in when we looked at um, um, document retention and, and the importance of, of uh, document keeping uh, and management, very, very helpful to us. Thank you. Uh, audience, that concludes our webinar today. A big thank you, Ross and Leah, for presenting. We appreciate the time and effort you've put into both preparing and presenting today. Um, to our audience, thank you again for tuning in. We hope this uh, session was informative and helpful, particularly for two topics that um, are sometimes not the easiest to understand. As mentioned earlier, this session is being recorded and we will hopefully have a copy out to you early next week and you'll be able to find a copy on Work Cover Queensland's YouTube channel. Um, so thank you very much and have a great day.